Hello, everybody. This is uh, Kula Nautil that seminar uh, on April 11, uh, 2022. Um, Cultural Data Analytics Open Lab Seminar. Today, uh, we have a lab encounter with uh, the Cultural Evolution crowd, slash the Center for Cultural Evolution at Stockholm University, which is a great pleasure and sort of adds another beat on our little uh, uh, pearl necklace around the Baltic Sea, where uh, we have digital humanities, network science, multidisciplinary science, cultural evolution, computational social science, and here, cultural uh, data analytics. And so whenever there is a larger bunch of people doing something similar around one word, there is probably something really new and interesting stuff coming out. And so it's our greatest pleasure to have Johan Lind and all your colleagues um, giving us a little intro in what you're doing. We uh, have in general, sort of like how we do this usually, either talks and lab encounters, we have uh, sort of, you know, the idea is to have 40 minute talk and, and 80 minute discussion. In lab encounters, typically it pans out a little different because, um, you know, there's more uh, talk, maybe less discussion, but um, the idea is to sort of like uh, start a conversation. and. Um, I just will give you the floor for the next uh, two hours and you uh, loop us in as much as you like at what point you like. We could discuss during the talks or after the talks or have all the talks and then discuss later. Uh, that depends a little bit on what you want to do. And uh, we're, we're just curious in the audience. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I will... Uh go ahead and share my screen and uh, we will take it and I will uh, start with introducing the center. Um, so here we go. So first I'd like to say big thanks to Maximilian who invited us to this event. Uh, we're very glad to be here. It's a pleasure. Um, and First things first, I'd just like to say a few things about our center and the Center for Cultural Evolution here at Stockholm University is an interdisciplinary research center. And uh, as one of the uh, core of our center is to do research on causal relationships that shape and change human culture. And uh, the focus of the talks today will be on the other leg or core issues of the center, and that is the origin of human culture. So the, the longer talks today will focus on the origin of human culture. And as a center, we want to provide an environment here at Stockholm University where scientists and students from all corners of sciences, like from the humanities, from the natural and social sciences and mathematics to work together and Hello. <laughs> Hello. Not frozen. So, uh, Johan, you're frozen if you can still hear us. Um, it's probably the monodisciplinary uh, enemies who <laughs> <laughs> just shut down multidisciplinarity. No I'm kidding. Um, if I'm somebody... calling Johan, saying that he's Thank frozen. You That's great. Maybe he can just log out and log back in. You're one. And we will be happy to cut this out. <laughs> he says it's online. It should be working. He'll be right back. Okay. So cool how routine we're all having uh, have become with <laughs> Zoom issues. Hello. <laughs> I am so sorry. I have no idea what happened. We need uh, 
So the last thing we heard was uh, that um, what you have going on is a collaboration between the humanities, natural sciences, you know, mathematics, and Stockholm University. And I think if you just continue where you stop, you can just cut out the piece. I will, thanks. So I was right. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, that kind of, I just have to move this around and I will be good to go. Yeah, so um, as I said, so physically you will find us here at Wallenberg Lab at Stockholm University. And uh, the center started in 2007, uh, a historian, Arne Jarrik, here from Stockholm University, together with his uh, biologist, Magnus Ian Quist, who is now the current director, started the center. Uh, and at the moment, I'm the deputy director of the center. So when we talk about cultural evolution, Culture change is a broad topic and uh, it's really taught and research in many disciplines. And one thing we think is important here is that as separate disciplines focus on specific domains or time periods or methods, we feel that there's, there are risks for scientific fragmentation, making it difficult to embrace the existing knowledge. And uh, we therefore think that this interdisciplinary research initiative is an important way forward. And that also is at the core of our teaching here at the center, where we teach cultural evolution from a very broad perspective, where we wish to introduce students to different perspectives of cultural evolution and this emerging new research field. So we're trying, well, I mean, it's not easy, but we're trying to break down barriers as much as we can to counteract this scientific fragmentation. And uh, when we say cultural evolutions, what do we mean? Uh, it, this term, cultural evolution, it's not a label for a particular theory, but I think it's a nice way to think about it as a unifying field for interdisciplinary research on cultural emergence and change. And human culture is continuously changing and we see a stunning diversity and it also affects most aspects of our lives. So, with culture, we also talk about culture in the broadest meaning. We include phenomena that to some extent depend on social transmission of information. It can be a material culture or non-material culture. So politics, technology, religion, language, law, what have you. And when we teach cultural evolution here, uh, these are some of the core questions we think are important to discuss or address when we have our courses. Questions about how social environment influence the individual. Are some cultural traits more likely to spread than others? And also the different time scales of cultural evolution. Are there long-term patterns? Are there short-term patterns? How can we observe so much diversity? And then the origin aspects. What genetic factors make it possible for us as it, an animal species to have culture? And what role do any of these genetic factors have or do they play? So just an introduction of our center. The plan that we have for today's meeting is that I will, I will start and continue with a short, some 20, 25 minute presentation uh, about some of the research that ha we have going here at the center. After me, Anna Jonand, she's a linguist and senior lecturer here at Stockholm University. She will give a talk, some a similar time frame, so 20, 25 minutes on a development of the research that I'm going to present. And uh, we will end off with Erik Forsberg, who is a PhD student at the Department of Psychology here at the Stockholm University. And he's also a member of our center. And he will give a final presentation where he will introduce uh, research he is working on. So the plan is that we should finish within about an hour and then leave ample room for discussion. Uh, 
So, I think uh, I just continue with my presentation then about some research. Yes. So the human evolutionary transition from nature to culture is the title of my talk. And I will talk about research that has, or it's been quite a long journey, I should say this talk. And it, it's been a long journey both for us as individuals, but also for us as a species. And taking, I could, going back in time in a way, if we just look at the world, most of Earth's history, it's been completely without culture on a grand scale. If we just go back a million years, we've had 500 million years plus of other animals inhabiting this world without this massive amount of culture we see today. So biologically, humans are just one out of many animals. It's been estimated that there are some 7.7 .7 million animal species on Earth today. And we're just another mammal, another ape biologically. But then some 300,000 years ago, when our species evolved, things on Earth has quite dramatically changed. So to just a manifestation of human activities, we can just look at, we seem to be the species that can put down cables on the seafloor. So this is just a map showing this weird phenomenon that we put cables on the seafloor and the black line is just an example of one such cable. That's the TAT-14, the transatlantic telephone cable. It's a 15,000 kilometer long cable and it transfers lots of information, some 3.2 terabytes per, terabytes per second. So this, in this project, this was one of the main questions that we wanted to understand. How can we understand this major evolutionary transition where before there were animals, occupying earth without culture on a grand scale. And then something happened with the species, humans, that enabled us to put down cables on the sea floor because we want to transmit data between computers, iPhones, and even refrigerators. So to tackle these questions, uh, we were, we've been three people working on this together for a long time. So it's uh, Stefano Girlanda, who's a psychologist at Brooklyn College, New York. And then Magnus Ian Quist here at the center in Stockholm and me. So we've been working on this together since 2007, approximately. That's when I came to the center. And one of the goals has been then to understand similarities and differences between humans and uh, other animals and how we can understand, how can we understand what enables humans to do all these strange things we do, like bird watching or destroying the earth through exploitation or have these university meetings or things like this. So this talk will be like an overview of um, a book that we are about to publish. Everything is delayed due to COVID. So this book will come out sometime in, the aut in autumn, I think maybe in November, December. Um, th so this is the book that is the result from then, gosh, it's 15 years of research into these questions. And we call it the human evolutionary transition from animal intelligence to culture. In this book, it's centered around uh, about seven hypotheses that come out. And I will go through each of these hypotheses during my talk. So the first one is that humans, in contrast to all other animal species today, took a very different path to, to intelligence. And this is a synthesis of a lot of ideas, of course, in both social science, the humanities and natural sciences. But it can also, in some areas, it's a bit of a controversial stance. Uh, and there is a lot of controversy revolving around how strong the genetic influence is on human intelligence and culture, and also how similar it is to other animals. But this is the first of the hypothesis. The second one is that, if we look at non-human animals, the intelligence emerges from an interplay between learning and genetics. And so we, I have a background in ethology 
And ethology teaches us how animals are well adapted to the environment. If we go to psychology, learning and memory and perception are important part that we've taken uh, into account to understand this. And then also lots of inspiration from current animal cognition research uh, in terms of how animals can process information. And going through animal behavior knowledge, we have been interested in understanding thinking-like mechanisms. What thinking-like mechanisms can we find? And can we understand some kind of uh, evolutionary trajectory towards human thinking? Due to all of the research that has been done by you know, lots of people for the last hundreds of hundred years, uh, we really push the notion that we think there's a good case today for a synthesis between these very different aspects of animal behavior, ethology, psychology, animal cognition. One of the important reasons for this is that we have solid learning theory and re reinforcement learning theory that we can used to, uh, we can perform computer simulations and we can have a strong theoretical basis for um, judging different empirical findings. And in our own research, we have described formally an associative learning model. And this model is at the heart of the, this part of the book, um, because we're, and we're, uh, have been trying to explore what this associative learning model can produce in terms of behavior and compare that to empirical findings in the literature. And we see that it really matches lots of findings, the major findings in animal psychology. Um, and also in terms of the ethology, we see that this model can also give rise to optimal behavior if given enough information. And it will also produce learning or behavior sequences, which is also very important if we are to account for lots of findings in the animal behavior literature. We also see that it accounts for the social learning phenomena we see in non-human animals. Uh, examples are stimulus and local enhancement, emulation, and uh, simple imitation of single behaviors. So theoretically, we can understand how other species, for instance, learn to make tools. So this, we can understand the theoretical learning basis for tool use in say this orangutan that has learned to make an umbrella to protect from rain. Or we can also account for findings, for instance, when chimps learn to open nuts using stone tools or collect honey or ants using sticks. So this kind of social learning that can account for uh, traditions found in other animals are well, uh, well, we can understand the base of how, these, how this emerges through this learning model. Another finding is that animal intelligence seems to be superior to human intelligence in many situations. And we especially see this when we have examples when behavior sequences to be learned are fairly short. And also when there's limited information in the world, then we see that human thinking or models of human thinking will perform much worse due to the massive learning costs when it, in, in terms of time and energy. Um, and we think this is an important point that is often underestimated that many, that many hypotheses for human intelligence uh, focuses a lot on uh, why it's so adaptive, there are so many benefits, and that leaves room for, uh, it's difficult then to understand why is there only one species that have this kind of culture, and why didn't it evolve in many other species? So accounting for the costs of human thinking is one of the important things. And I would also, uh, a heads up for Anna's talk. So the next presentation by Anna Jovnand, Yes, so thank, thank you very much. Uh, Anna, you can just uh, share the screen if you like. Thank you. Johan. So I think it, it, um... oh, he's just referring to your thing and then we have to call him again because uh, we're, we're, the screen is frozen again, right? Sorry. Yes, I think Johan's talk is not finished, but- Exactly, yeah. 
I can go on perhaps. I'll see. I'm trying, I'm just trying to call him. Just wait a little. Okay. I just told him. Okay. Oh, you're, yeah. Hey, Johan, du frös igen. Okay, he'll be coming back to finish what he has to say, I think. Just Hello again. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know what happens because this is, uh, well, let me just, uh, I'm halfway through. Uh, yes. Without further ado. Nice. Uh, so let me just do this. So for this reason, we see that other animals perform remarkable behaviors that humans have no uh, way of being able to perform on our own, like uh, migratory birds migrating thousands of kilometers on their own. Uh, and the next thing is that we see that human intelligence relies on collecting a lot of information, often of uncertain value. And here we have dramatic differences between humans and other animals. Uh, these graphs come from what are called delayed matching to sample experiments. So if you look at me and ignore the slide for a couple of seconds, imagine an experiment where you're, you may be a pigeon. And first you see one stimulus, it can be a banana. And you observe that stimulus and it disappears. And after some delay, say 10 seconds, two stimuli appear. It could be an apple and a banana. And if you choose the same one, you will get the food reward. So this methodology allows researchers to probe the duration of other species memory. And what we see is that other species forget within half a minute or a minute, an arbitrary stimulus. And we don't see that, for instance, primates have a better general short-term memory than pigeons or rats. There are no distinct uh, taxonomic differences among animals. Uh, and it doesn't even uh, say these specialist hoarders that, uh, for instance, nutcrackers and jays that may hide acorns or peanuts for, for months and remember where they store those food. For these arbitrary short-term memories, they forget just as quickly as pigeons. And this is in stark contrast with observations of human memory. If you have these classic recall experiments where people write in a diary what they're doing and after between uh, two and 46 days, they're asked to recall what they've been doing. Uh, they re we can remember arbitrary things for a very long time. Another thing is that humans, we seem to collect information in a way that has been suggested that other animals do. So these are classic latent learning experiments. Uh, and these have, are still cited today as if other animals collect information. These experiments were made so that a rat was put into a maze and they were allowed to explore the maze without any food rewards. And the hypothesis was that they actually learned about the maze. So when a food reward was introduced, they would have learned quicker. And if we look at the empirical findings, from these classic experiments, we see that the experimental group is the on the left, it's the group three, where we see that learning dips quickly. And it's the no food reward until day 11 line on the right graph. And if we do the same experiments and we simulate it through our learning model, we see that the, the kind of associative learning model will reproduce the same result. So there is no need for the latent learning idea. The fifth hypothesis is that the transition between oh, that enabled humans to become this cultural animal depends on a few changes to domain general abilities. And one of the most important factors here is that also Anna will continue to talk about 
is about memory for sequences. So if we look at animal data on this type of experiment, so the first row there, you see a blue circle followed by a yellow square. If we are to train an animal to choose one button for blue, yellow, they will get a food reward. If they see the same colors and shapes in the opposite direction, they can only be rewarded if they choose a different button. So these kind of sequence discriminations where they are to discriminate between say blue, yellow versus yellow first, then blue. That seems to be a very difficult thing for other animals to do. So this is a graph from a paper we published in 2017, where we see that it doesn't matter if we look at uh, dolphins, dogs, uh, crows, ravens, Telling the difference between sequences of stimuli seemed to be something very difficult for non-human animals. And we noted a lack of precision in recognizing and remembering sequences. So this is the kind of same idea, the old idea that we don't see that other animals represent order. And we don't have data yet on uh, bonobos, but we have done some preliminary studies. And this is just a video showing uh, Kansi doing this experiment. This is a pre-training where he's um, job, doing a match of the sample. And so far, the data looks like this. After some 2,400 tries, these uh, bonobos are still doing at 50%. So telling the difference between blue-yellow versus yellow-blue seems to be a very fundamental, difficult thing for non-human animals. Um, we're still working on uh, sp specific tests of this hypothesis. But what we find is that other animals don't seem to collect arbitrary information. We also then see that other animals do not seem to have a faithful representation of sequential information. And we cannot find uh, studies showing that other animals do the kind of internal simulations that are what we think about as thinking. So this sequence memory to recognize and remember sequences seems to be a very fundamental part. And it might be one of the core reasons then why we don't find episodic memory, causal learning, planning, language, et cetera, in other animals. And it's also interesting that if we look at, uh, I mean, other animals, the basis for culture is of course, a social transmission of information. And we see lots of social learning among other animals. Um, it's important for uh, apes, great apes, for lots of things. It's important for mammals and other birds for learning what to eat, etc. But I would just like to say that the kind of the, the question you always get when you talk about these things is that what about birds? They can imitate, they sing, they learn their song. And I think that's a very remarkable case where. Uh, songbirds, parrots have evolved this uh, specialized memory for learning songs. And interestingly, when we put these songbirds in the same kind of sequence discrimination experiments, they perform like all the other animals. So it seems to be a very specialized memory for just learning to sing. So these few abilities then enable cultural evolution. And so we propose that cultural evolution is not only about behavioral skill, but it's also profound for mental skills, understanding, creativity, planning, social learning. This is very close to the ideas uh, Cecilia Hayes has written about in her book, uh, Cultural Gadgets. So a few inborn changes enabled cultural evolution, and we don't find this in other animals then. And as cultural evolution picked up, lots of new skills then evolved through cultural evolution. So to kind of visualize this, we can have a, just playing with ideas that if we took a child from 300,000 years ago, could that child be learned to read and write? And contrasting different hypotheses, if we go to these two different ideas, we, 
have the idea that on the right hand side here, that some 300,000 years ago, at, at least, at, least uh, at the latest with our species, these few decisive uh, mental capacities evolved, allowing then cultural evolution of other things such as language, causal reasoning, planning, etc. So according to this idea, yes, perhaps we could travel back in time and take a child from 300,000 years ago, put in school today, they would learn the same things. And this is then in contrast to think and in, for instance, evolutionary psychology, where the idea is that uh, distinct and uh, independent mental modules have evolved so that humans are a set of uh, independent collections of genetic modules, so to speak. So, for humans, culture is really the reservoir of mental and behavioral skills, enabling us to learn things that are way beyond what we could learn through ourselves alone. And when we have a world where there's lots of cultural information and we learn long behavior sequences, then we see that thinking outperforms associative learning. So we emphasize the extensive time and social interactions that are needed for human capacities to fully develop. And in our book, we draw from key observations in develop, de developmental psychology. And it's clear from developmental psychology that throughout childhood, sequential abilities develop very gradually, and there's a progressive refinement of skills. And these are just examples from counting, speech perception, uh, memory span for digits, course of understanding, reading and writing, etc. So hypothesis number seven then is that the origin of human evolution transition depends really on life history evolution feeding back to cultural evolution of mental skills. So we can have this model of increased duration of parental care. If we need to learn a lot, we need a longer childhood. And this makes it possible then to get more cost-free learning because as adults, we provide for the children. And this can then give rise to learning longer and more behavioral sequences. And this makes then more sequential information being available in the social environment. And this first part, the increased dur duration of parental care has been established by uh, several papers by Kaplan, for instance, and this is a graph where we compare humans with chimpanzees. In the solid line, you see the net food production from an individual chimpanzee. And you see that at about five years of age, they go to net zero so they can fend for themselves. It takes almost 20 years for human to get to the positive side of this line. And we also see that humans can then uh, have a much larger net food production for a very long time. And um, humans don't seem to peak until around 40, 50 years of age. So as culture evolves, problems too complex for single individuals can be solved. And it shapes lots of them behavioral and mental mechanisms. And to sum up, uh, we conclude in our book then that everything uniquely human seems to be derived from a few genetically based changes where this faithful sequence memory seems to be at the heart of this problem. And of course, mental flexibility. This then makes learning new mental skills possible. And we think that this may be the reason that sparked cultural evolution itself. And an important final point is that whatever it is exactly that humans evolved, this has not uh, replaced systems we see in other animals, but we still have those other systems we share with other animals. So whatever humans evolved, it has been integrated with these other systems and not replaced them. So thanks a lot for that. And uh, I don't know how you want to do if you want to save questions until all the talks or if you would like. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank you very much first. Uh, th this was very inspiring. Um, and this, uh, usually there's the awkward sirens of Zoom applause, I guess. Um, I'm, 
I, I think we should just go on um, because otherwise we run the danger that we um, sort of run out of time for the last speaker, maybe. Yep. Uh, but this is certainly super, super inspirational. And, and we yeah, but, 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 but this way we, we run into into a uh, problem that we will forget our questions and they will be completely irrelevant by the time we, we oh, ask. True. Okay, so um, is everybody in the audience um, should we should we have one or two brief questions right now? Does that work out? There was one. Okay, so one brief question, Mike. Well, actually, I wanted. To, thank you very much. It was it was extremely extremely interesting, and I learned quite a lot of interesting stuff from what you said. Uh, but actually, I the, the reason I, I I wanted to ask questions now they, because they are mostly about clarifying what you said in, in, in a couple of places. Uh, question number one: uh, When you speak about the sequences of blue and yellow and yellow and blue. Is it temporal sequence or is it spatial sequence? So, so that black, red is, so yellow is on the right and, and blue is on the left, because it seemed like that in, in, in the video you showed. Uh, sorry, the video was a bit misleading. It was from a, a spatial one. No, uh, it's a temporal sequence that we can order stimuli in time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and the, the, the second question is basically uh, about that uh, red labyrinth experiment. Maybe I, I missed something because I understand that you, your result is basically that there is no uh, learning of, uh, of uh, well, needless information in, in reds, but, but I, I sort of can't quote how, how, how the... the um, data supports that. Can can you maybe explain this once again? Yeah, um, it, it's always difficult to give so much information in such a brief package. But yeah, <laughs> so basically, when you when you have these rats, and if you use this uh, learning simulator or uh, associative learning model, and you make computer simulations of them running into these uh, places, rats they hate running into an empty arm. Mm -hmm. So if you just uh, perform a learning simulation where the rats do, do not appreciate running into an empty arm ha having to run back, mm -hmm. they will very rapidly learn to finish the maze without any kind of food reward. So the patterns that are found in these uh, classic Blodgett and uh, Tolman and Honsik papers the, mm -hmm. you, will, you will get the exact same data if you just allow the rats to not like to run into empty arms. Uh, they will learn about that without there being any kind of food rewards or anything like that. Mm -hmm. so that's the but, but then they will remember uh, not to run there when they get a reward. Yeah, so when they get the reward, when the reward is introduced, they will increase the, they will run more rapidly mm -hmm. to get to the reward, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very much. And I, I should also point out that that when you do these kind of learning simulation, also in, in associative learning, uh, when you have learned something with this kind of, uh, when you have a stimulus and a behavior and a reward, those are of course then long-term memories. So they will last for, you know, very long times. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's no hands up, let's continue with Anna Yona. Um, stage is yours. I think you should be able to share your screen. I can make your co-host just in case. I'm, I'm sharing now. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, yes? great. So thank you. Uh, I also want to thank you very much for this invitation. It's really nice to have this kind of lab meeting, I think. And it will be very nice to have some time also to discuss our research more with your group. Uh, and as you once said, I'm a linguist and I work, I'm really interested in both language origin and mechanisms of language change. Uh, today I will present uh, the most recent work that I'm doing that builds very much upon the work that Johannes presented by him and uh, Stefano and Magnus. And it is on sequence representation as an early step in the evolution of language. 
And this is work that I am doing well together with Johan and Stefano and Magnus and also with mathematician Marcus Jonsson that is here today. Um, so just some very brief background to the question of the origin of human language. Uh, human language is unique. We don't find language that is compositional, sequential, open-ended, and uh, uh, so on in other species. So we have some very central big questions in language evolution. Why did language evolve? Uh, we tend to hear uh, explanations based on the advantages of communication, which is reasonable, and it is very advantageous to be able to communicate. But then uh, the difficult question to answer is why has it not evolved? It is advantageous, so why didn't it evolve in other species in this form? Uh, another big question is what actually evolved? So uh, as you one also mentioned, theories range from more modular, genetically determined linguistic abilities, uh, also more language specific learning processes that would also be genetically determined. These kinds of explanations do not account very well, uh, tend not to account very well for the huge variation we see in language. It's also difficult to explain language evolution because it's, if something is language specific, we need to have other individuals that have language already for this to be beneficial. So it becomes a bit of a paradox. So uh, we are a bit more inclined to the general purpose learning theories where the form of language would emerge more by cultural evolution. However, there is a central question remaining then, which are the minimal differences that would then explain why other animals cannot acquire language. So some grand sort of challenges in language evolution historically and presently would be to suggest some minimal uniquely human cognitive elements that may underlie language. Also to explain why have they not evolved in non-human animals and to identify a plausible evolutionary trajectory from no language to language. So we build this theoretical work that I will present on the suggestion that Johan has presented that sequence representation would be a basic requirement for the evolution and la of language, as well as other uniquely human phenomena related to cumulative culture. And uh, we, this is the hypothesis, well, because it's clear that sequential structure is important in language. And as you once showed, we have very strong, quite new empirical support for uh, the claim that humans process sequential information more accurately than other animals. The aims of the study I'm presenting now, which is purely theoretical, is to dig deeper into these claims and uh, model them in a more precise way. And in that way, to provide a logically plausible trajectory for the evolution of uniquely human cognition and language based on the hypothesis that human culture is rooted in sequential processing abilities. And this we have done by mathematical modeling and learning simulations where we analyze the utility of sequence representation and we model some uh, more precise suggestions of how sequences may be represented. Uh, so let's start with talking about the benefits and uh, not least the costs of sequential information. We all use uh, animals and humans stimuli to understand our environment and respond to it. And we receive a stream of stimuli uh, and some of them convey relevant information and others are less relevant. If we look at language, uh, almost all stimuli in sequences we perceive such as sounds or words or, or gestures, for example, tend to be informative. Uh, if we look at information in nature, so to say, in a pre-cultural world, we find much less information organized in sequences as such, but past stimuli can still be important. So let's look at an example. A bird sees a bug 
and then the bug disappears under a rock. And we can compare this with uh, a different example where the bird sees a leaf, the leaf disappears and the bird sees a rock. And in this case, it's good to consider history because if the bird is only seeing the last stimulus here, it will see a rock and these two situations will be the same. Whereas in the first situations, it's beneficial to stick around, look for the bug. And in the second situation, the bird should just go on with their life basically and do something else. So, but the problem here is that we see then that it is good to consider historical information, but to consider past stimuli multiplies the number of perceptually distinct situations that the animal needs to learn to respond to. So let's say that a bird consider the last four stimuli and we're still only looking at these three different stimuli, but then the bird needs to learn how to respond to uh, leaf, rock, bug, rock, bug, uh, no, sorry, rock, bug, leaf, <laughs> rock, leaf, uh, bug, rock, leaf, bug, and so on. There will be a lot of different situations to learn to respond to when actually the only thing the bird is interested in is the bug. And the, the thing is that the time it costs to learn the best response to each of those sequences can void the benefit of considering longer sequences. So the question we ask now and in a mathematical model that we have built is when would evolution favor taking sequential information into account? So, and, um, then we estimate the fitness of an organism that uses the L last stimuli to make decisions. So we call L the decision depth. And if there are N number of stimuli in the world and all sequences exist, the individual will be able to perceive N to the power of L sequences. So when the decision depth L increases, the number of sequences to learn to respond to increases exponentially. It increases very rapidly. Uh, and, and of course, the individual needs to learn all of this. So this means that a lot of learning is required. Uh, a productive decision uh, is the option between a number of behaviors that is basically the best in a situation, such as eating when you see food or not eating when you don't see food. And the fitness in our model is um, modeled as the expected number of productive decisions over a whole lifetime. So the more you learn, the more productive decisions you make in the future. So it's good once you have learned that you live for a long time so you can use what you have learned basically. Uh, so the question is, what is the optimal decision depth? This is uh, what we are looking at under different conditions. And here I will visualize uh, just one example of visualization of our most important results. So this uh, phase diagram shows the optimal decision depth L when we, we vary the very important parameter T, which is the total number of learning times. It's the lifetime, or it could also be the free learning of the individual. And we vary the number of stimuli here from zero to 30. So it's really a tiny little world that we have modeled. And still, we see that under a majority of conditions, the maximum utility is achieved for depth one. That is only considering the last stimulus. So this dark blue area here represents optimal decision depth one, lighter blue two, the green becomes smaller is three, four, very small part, uh, and decision depth five, uh, is almost not visible at all. And uh, of course, if we increase the number of stimuli to a more reasonable world, let's say <laughs> some thousands of stimuli, well, then the entire area will be covered. Ba basically, the entire area will be covered by uh, the optimal depth one. So this quite striking result is because the decision depth increases learning time due to the exponential growth of number of sequences to learn. And here we can basically see that natural selection would never favor looking back into history. It would be almost impossible. The only thing that could favor this would be an extremely long learning time, because this is what we see here with T. When T increases, well, then the area for the longer 
decision depths also increase. But in, in a reasonably large world, there would have to be an extremely long learning time for uh, a, a longer decision, a deeper decision depth to be selected for. So this is a little bit strange because we actually know that humans do need to consider sequences for cultural information. And we also know that animals are able to take uh, previous inf information into account in their decisions. So we then model some uh, representation mechanisms in learning simulations uh, that might answer the questions uh, how animals and later also humans, but we start with animals, how they can use information from the past without the full combinatorial cost of sequential information that the model points to. So we look at something called trace memory that has very strong support in the literature. Uh, that Johan and Magnus and Stefano have also investigated. And the trace memory works more or less like this. It's a representation of stimuli uh, where uh, th they are fading traces with no internal order. So here is time and we will perceive two stimuli that we call A and B. And we see that uh, they have fading traces over time. So if I'm going to make a decision at this point of time, then I will perceive a weaker faded A and a stronger not faded B. They have no internal order. They might as well be B and A. The important thing is that the later one is stronger. This kind of representation reduces the number of stimuli to learn about drastically. Uh, because the order is not represented and also because the organism look at uh, the single stimuli and they support uh, the decision making individually, not as a group. So that means that there are much less to learn about than if you look at entire sequences. And this has quite strong support in the literature from several different studies. Uh, so in the learning simulations, we compare trace memory to more accurate sequence representations that would correspond to what we model in the mathematical model that I just showed you. So here is trace, and then you can look at depth one that only perceives the last, only represents, that is, I shouldn't say perceived because everything is perceived, but at the moment of decision, uh, the perception, the representation is only of the last stimulus. So it's only B in this case. Uh, if we go on to depth two, then it will represent the sequence of the last two stimuli as a unit. So their sequential order will be represented as with this arrow, and they will be represented as a group. They're chunked. So this sequence as a whole will contribute to the decision at the decision moment, A, B. So let's see how the different mechanisms perform. Uh, we compare them and evaluate how fast and how much they learn. And uh, importantly, we also compare different information distributions. So this means that uh, in these three uh, environment, environments that, uh, that we call them, so we build different environments where the different representations uh, get to learn. And in the first one, all information is in the last stimulus. So we have in the last uh, uh, time step, sorry. So we have 32 informative stimuli and the rest is noise. So the other stimuli don't convey important information for the decisions. So in the first uh, simulation, you just need to look at the last stimulus and you can learn everything. In the second one, the 32 informative stimuli are equally distributed over four time step. And in the third one, all information is four steps back in time. And in the first one, if we look at that, depth one is the fastest learner. That's the blue learning curve. Here we see the proportion of correct responses over time. So we see how much each individual have learned at each time step or trial. So the blue line is fastest, but it's just a little bit faster than trace memory. So actually trace memory is almost as effective as depth one that perceives all the information we need and only that. And this is because trace memory 
uh, has a, a larger intensity on the last stimulus. So it's easy for trace memory to ignore uh, the noise in the previous stimuli. When we come to different information distributions, we can see that trace memory owns the world, basically. It's much, much faster than the other mechanisms. And we can see that uh, the depth also decreases the learning, increases the learning time. So uh, depth one is initially faster, and then comes depth two and depth, depth three and depth four. We can't actually see the learning, but depth four eventually learns. It's just very, very slow. And even when the information is four steps back in time, well, trace memory is much faster than the other ones. So we can see how these uh, decreased costs really help. So the effectiveness of a trace memory may explain why this is actually what most animals seem to have as a general kind of memory mechanism. And uh, we can also see here that this is a very powerful and productive compromise that may prevent accurate sequence representation from evolving. So here we have quite a good answer to the question, why not other animals, right? <laughs> Both from the mathematical model and from the trace memory, we can see that, yeah, it's clear that uh, it's very unlikely that something else than this would evolve. But now we are looking at the evolution of accurate sequence representation because uh, this is fundamental in cultural information, as you one pointed out. And language is a very clear example. We need to discriminate immediately and exactly between A, B and B, A when we process language. I know immediately what the difference between killer whale and whale killer is. I can insert another word there. I can say killer wog or wog killer. We all know wog, but I can say something else and I will also understand it. So we know that this is something that humans can do. And for a trace memory, this is much more difficult. And you did see the performance of Kansi. It wasn't great on this kind of discrimination. So, we're left with some kind of mystery because this seems to be so costly and what kind of machinery could evolve that can support accurate sequence discrimination without these huge learning costs that we have seen right so uh, we go back to simulations and we actually modify the depth to uh, representation a little bit so this one, uh, the one we have shown so far, it chunks the entire sequence and does nothing more. And Johan also pointed out the flexibility is something important for the human cognition. So we try to make it more flexible. So we do this just like before, but we also have access to the internal chunks of the chunk, so to say. So at the moment of the session, we see not only the sequence AD, but also the individual A and the individual B. So basically, uh, we chunk all the subsequences within the original chunked sequence. So this is for two, but for three, we will chunk the adjacent sequences of two uh, and three and one and so on. So the advantage here is that this enables the representation and the perception of the similarity between, for example, A, B and X, B, because the B is there, or A, B, C and A, B, X, because the A, B is there. And the original depth too can't do that. Uh, it seems kind of biologically plausible if we just use some introspection, like if you have a sentence, the cat chases the dog, okay, we can chunk it and pass it to another discursive level, uh, to use modern Christiansen's terminology. We can also think about the cat as a unit, the dog as a unit, we can also remember all the individual words within it, so we seem to have that kind of flexibility when we process sequences. Uh, however, this yields a higher total, uh, higher number of representations because we are now going to look at sequences of length one, two, three, and four, if we go up to four, which we will do in the simulations. So the question is, is this more or less costly? To investigate this, we compare the old, uh, more, less flexible depth L to the flexible sequence, and we also include trace memory in a sequence environment and the sequence environment means that a b requires a different response from b a and also that they cannot be identified just by their first or last element so a and b 
occur in different uh, occasion in, in different sequences with noise stimuli and have no individual meaning. And we also work with four time steps over which we distribute the sequences. So here's the result. Well, the flexible sequence, the, the ability to single out the information seems to be much more important uh, than uh, using a, a lower total number of representations for each decision, because it's much faster than depth four, uh, trace memory does not learn as expected, because it can't do that exact sequence representation. And um, what we do next is that we vary the proportion of information or the probability of information being in sequences and in single stimuli. So we go down, we have 75% in sequences, 50-50, in sequences, and then all information in single stimuli. We do this because if we imagine a pre-cultural scenario, we are not going to find anything like this all information in sequences kind of scenario. So it's much more likely the P.25 or something between 25 and all information in single stimuli, that's kind of a more plausible scenario that we might be looking at. And there we can see that uh, flexible sequence suffers much higher learning costs than trace memory, but by far not as much as the depth four representation here. So this seems to be a more plausible uh, suggestion if we are looking at an exact mechanism, but it will need a lot of learning time to, to be better than trace. So that will explain why it's still so unlikely to evolve. I mean, this is a tiny world in a larger world. It will need even more learning time to go past trace as it actually does after some time. So that leads us to uh, the conclusions of this study. Flexible sequence representation seems to be the most efficient one of the ones we have tried that can provide some support, basic support for language. Uh, it can only evolve when two conditions are fulfilled. A reasonable amount of uh, information in sequences and a high number of learning opportunities. And this is something we may see in a pre-human kind of world. We see this in big primates, but probably not enough. They have a longer learning time than average, and they are good learners and very flexible. So they do learn some sequences, they use tools. So that means that there is more uh, sequentially structured information in the environment than average, but perhaps not enough. It needs to be very much of these two for, for this to happen. So we sort of explain, at least we try to explain both the unlikeliness of this event, but also uh, make a suggestion for under what conditions it would actually happen. Um, so then once we have this small but important change from approximate, that is trace memory, to accurate sequence representation, well then, of course, individuals can start to, to imitate and produce longer sequences. A uh, small compositional proto-language can emerge and we will have much more uh, sequentially structured information in the environment that would favor the biological selection of a longer life history and longer uh, le free learning time that Johan also spoke about as very important. So here we would see sort of the, the seed that would enable cultural evolution of language, planning, thinking, sharing symbols, cumulative culture, basically. And this would be a gene culture co-evolution scenario where what changes genetically mainly would be the learning time. And that also get, has very good support in, in the data on in what we know that humans have a very long childhood in comparison to other animals. And to one of the big questions is the difference between humans and other animals of a degree or a kind. Our results suggest that humans have evolved a different kind of sequence representation more accurate than other animals, this would be a small but very significant step that could give rise to a gradual and mainly culture, cultural evolution of mental skills and also of language. And that's the conclusions for my part. And I would love to hear some questions if you have them. Of course, we will listen to Eric as well, but I don't know, you, you decide. <laughs> uh, 
if you want to ask some questions now. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, maybe let's do the same thing, like have clarifying one or two questions right now and then continue. So first, applause to the speaker again. Thank you very much. Um, Mark Metz has a question, who's our in-house semiotician. Great. Uh, thank, thank you for the fascinating talk. Uh, so I, I was wondering, so is, is, are the results somehow at odds with the, uh, uh, well, I, I guess, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that the more recent finding that uh, like even non-primate non animals, they have uh, syntactic features in their language. How does it uh, go together? So uh, we need to define syntactic features. So are you referring to artificial grammar experiments or which there are so many different paradigms that... Yeah, like, I mean, like, yeah, perhaps like grammar. like. Um... Yeah, so, I mean, artificial grammar is really, it's, it's uh, those are syntax rules for computer languages. And I don't really think, I mean, they are not, even the artificial grammar, people sort of agree on that this is not really uh, comparable to human language grammar. But the thing is that they are inconclusive. They, we, we, we have no strong support for animals reproducing. I mean, you can see that a simple rule like same different can be reproduced, but that's also something that we can perhaps learn without a sequence memory. That can be a simple association. So anything, any syntactic rule that would require a sequence representation longer than one, I have not seen, and I have gone through the reviews of artificial grammar and so on, both in humans and animals, and in humans it's different, of course. And I, yeah, I, it, it is at odds with those that claim that, I mean, it, it depends on the rule. If it requires uh, uh, complete sequence representation, it's, uh, it doesn't work. Yeah, I would say. <laughs> I mean, show me a counter result and I will look at it, but I have gone through a lot of them. Yeah, thank you. Everybody's thinking about fungi signaling right now. Johan. Thanks. I, I would just like to uh, say to, uh, to Mark uh, that in the 2017 paper that Magnus and Stefano and I uh, wrote where we looked at sequence discriminations in other anim in other species than humans. We have <coughs> sorry, we have several included all the uh, artificial grammar studies in uh, birds. So what we see is that with the trace model that Anna showed you, that the with such a model, you can account for the findings of such successful sequence uh, discriminations in birds without any kind of faithful sequence memory that is needed for the kind of grammar that we talk about in human languages. I mean, even there is a more recent review by Tankate, who, who is actually yeah. in favor of artificial grammar, of birds being able to, to process artificial grammar. And the conclusion of that uh, review is that results are inconclusive and this is probably because experiments are not good enough so I would suggest that it might also be because you can't actually find what you're looking for it's, it's opposite, fascinating the, the opposite uh, possibility would be that uh, there is way more sequence memory in, in animals we just haven't found the right way to test it yes yeah. of course yeah. that's that's I mean uh, the null hypothesis here would kind of be that the simple model that Magnus and Jumann and Stefano have presented that is able to explain a lot of data, that, that would be the null hypothesis and it seems to hold. But of course, you have a, a harder hypothesis, a, a more explicit suggestion that animals would be able to process sequences in a more accurate way. We don't need that more complicated model. It doesn't seem like it so far to explain uh, huge amounts of animal memory data. So, okay. I mean, we can still think that it's there, but if we don't have a counterexample, uh, yeah, as long as we don't need it, we don't have to go there. Once we see that we need it, okay, let's go there. Nice. So I think we should continue with Eric. Yes, thank you. I will try to be okay. as brief as possible. So I'm sharing my screen now, hoping you can all see it. Yeah. 
So my PhD product is about trying to understand moral differences. And I, the name of the product so far is Tracing Morals, because it's also the name of the first paper that is currently in press. So it's about understanding morals as a personality style or construct. That's the assumption that I'm working with. So it's about understanding what personality, moral personality dimensions can we claim exist and how can we measure them. And the approach that I settled for is a psychometric approach where I look at questionnaires and I've done a lot of reanalysis of famous questionnaires. And I focus only on large data sets in this context. That means more than 1,000 participants per sample. And I focus more or less only on item response theory. That may be a new thing to some of you. So I try not to be technical about it, just to give the conceptual idea. But it's about moving away from the test score or the scale score that is often used in questionnaires within psychology and focusing on the items. And the items in this case, case is the questions used to measure attitudes, preferences in, in the participants. And I'm also very fond of a methodological philosophy where you're supposed to look at the sample, the structure of the sample, to understand the structure of the sample rather than using a model to be forced on the sample. And this entails a shift from the conventional kind of conformative approach where you try to conform your ideas, your theoretical uh, uh, ideas that you have set for uh, beforehand towards something that's more descriptive. And by descriptive, I don't mean descriptive tables that is often used in psychological papers like mean va values and so on. Is it descriptive in terms of fulfilling uh, model requirements within uh, item uh, response theory? Uh, this is based mostly on the lexical hypothesis. That is that you can understand personality, in this case, moral personality, by studying language and how uh, people respond to the questions that the, and you change the items, the wording of the items to, to get constructs, psychological variables that you can study semantically. And this is because I am very fond of the idea that personality is hidden within language. And it's all, I also think that uh, language is not only is about acquiring the means for, for expressing an idea about uh, personality, but it's also something that you can use to be a person. It's something that is used to uh, construct your own sense of personality. And that's why I think this appro approach is very interesting. It's very fitting to the cultural evolutionary perspective. So, uh, my project is about comparing the conventional, what is called classical test theory against a, a more a relative sense in a modern test theory or item response theory. It isn't entirely new. It's been around for some time now, but it's, it, it's least periphery. It's not used as much. But it's if in, within classical test theory, you are, oh, as I said, concerned about the scales and mean scores mostly. And it's also the assumption is that the scores that you see in, in your scales are caused by the respondents in a test occasion. And you cannot really tease these apart other than repeating your tests over and over again. This is very flexible. And it's often fairly easy to calculate. Often you can do stuff by hand even. And it, you can do meaningful tests in small samples, but it is highly affected by chance results. So you're more or less forced to repeat your uh, tests uh, over an extended period of time. Item response field represents move away from this. It is uh, concerned with, with the behavior of the items and the items are considered to be almost like measurement units, almost like the centimeters on your ruler. You are studying them and, and extracting parameters. And the assumption is that these parameters will stay more or less the same across samples in even cultures uh, if they are really good. And it's also about estimating what is called ability so they're using this analysis to, to, to try to pin down the level of ability in the respondents. And the ability is what is assumed to be the cause of the scores that you see in your tests. Uh, this is computationally more heavy. It requires more time. It's more uh, uh, mathematical, uh, abstract, difficult to understand for, for some people. It's, that's the complaint I get anyway. It's also less flexible. But on the other hand, models and results that you see tend to stay the same. Uh, it represents a sort of a shift towards something that is more reliable in something that is less uh, culturally sensitive and so on to something that can sort of pin down what you're actually doing. If you're 
a, a way of understanding difference. I like this image of an iceberg, a classical test theory to me is if you assume this iceberg to be a large sample, then classical test theory or the conventional methods merely touches the tip of the iceberg. Whereas item response theory goes all the way down from the mean scores of the scales, the sort of broader outlook on what you're doing to the actual response option of the participant in the individual item in your test. So it's about exposing, chiseling out what goes on and from that, see what you have in front of you. Uh, the sad state of affairs at the moment is that it, these item response theory methods results are considered pre theory and kind of odd because most of the time they speak against against conventional theories that have been proven by classical test theory. So that is a it, it's sadly the state at the moment, but hopefully time will change this and my, maybe I could be a part of all of this. So my connection to cultural evolution is more or less based on the ideas of Cecilia Hayes, which I'm very fond of. And that is that personality is to a large extent learned. It is, however, biologically constrained. But I think that personality is a tool of the mind for expressing a sense of self, for being someone in the world and also relating yourself to others. That would mean like from a slogan perspective that we, we, maybe we can't be just about every type of person, but we can learn and change to be a lot of things. That may be uncomfortable because it induces a kind of sense of guilt. I'm not here to answer this question or solve that issue, but that is what I think I see in my measures and why they are so stable across samples and even cultures even that uh, the personality factors, in this case, moral factors that I see, they represent sort of directions or robust solutions to complex problem where, where you as an individual have to coordinate your body and mind in an in immensely complex external environment under the assumption that you have an eye inside you that's observing. I'm not here to really, my dissertation is not really going to be, give, give um, a strong uh, argument for this uh, proposition, but that's why I think uh, the results that I see are so, uh, should be uh, sort of uh, understood and why they should be valued and why you should move away from the conventional approach towards modern uh, style of analysis of questionnaires. Uh, I have a paper in press where I studied two large samples. One is a fairly known sample from a study in New Zealand, published by Davis in 2014. And also I compare the results, the Swedish large sample uh, published a bit later. And I started a famous questionnaire within psychology, at least, that's called Moral Foundations Questionnaire. It consists of 30 items. Uh, ordered into two subscales of 15 sub uh, items each. So we have the relevant subscale and a judgment subscale. And I use what is called mocking scale analysis and also something is called optimal scaling to study these measures. And that represents an introductory kind of relaxed way. It's also called non-parametric IoT that you can use to study the behavior of these items. So just to be brief, uh, the main findings was that I exposed clearly that the Moral Foundations questionnaire only measures two moral dimensions, it's supposed to measure five. Uh, and I also exposed that one of these subscales are more or less useless. You shouldn't use it. But one of the subscales was actually really good, and that was a relevant subscale. It did a really good job at measuring moral foundations, however, just two uh, moral dimensions. But also doing a semantic analysis of the content that I found pointed to theoretical contradiction in relation to more foundations theory. So that also proves another part of the use, useful of this approach that you can not only understand the, the, uh, the factors and direction, how they relate to each other, but you can also narrow down and pinpoint the actual content of these factors and how they relate. And so I shall not take much more of your time. So that's sort of a very brief uh, uh, explanation of my dissertation. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, applause to everybody, to the last speaker, Eric, and all the, all the ones before. So um, this is very exciting indeed. And um, as I um, let my group know, like, this is a very different approach to culture, maybe. Um, even though some of, some of us have rather similar approaches also, maybe. Um, and so one of the uh, things um, maybe to open this discussion is 
let me let me frame it this way. So uh, when Johan, you um, st uh, when you started your your uh, introduction of uh, cultural evolution, you had this slide where on one side there was a crocodile and a bunch of other animals in red. And then there was the world map with the ocean cables on the other side. And in between, there was a little arrow pointing to the right with the red question mark. And so uh, it happens that I have a very similar slide. Uh, it also has a little red arrow in the middle and a question mark. And uh, where the animals are, there is the real world. And um, so basically a drawing of ruins of the city of Rome. And then on the other side, there is a drawing of the city of Rome that is fully reconstructed. So the kind of idea is that humans sort of um, are confronted with some kind of real world and the information they have about it is incomplete and they go and complete it. And so this is sort of, uh, I cannot speak for everybody, but this is certainly one theme we have in the group. Uh, and that is certainly um, one of my guiding themes is what are these cultural meaning spaces that we construct in our minds, that are implicit in the documents that uh, sort of are produced in a group or society in general, you could say the scientific literature, like what's the, what's the perspective of physics of the current scientific literature as opposed to 1950 or something like that. And so that is sort of like, there, here's, there's two things going on. So you talk about transition where you say, okay, there is like animals, which also I would not say is a past thing. They're still around, they outnumber us greatly. And then there is um, ocean cables while there is incomplete information about some kind of reality, and then we make up something. So there is an obvious bridge to the linguistic work, uh, because obviously that is all about like telling narratives about that kind of like incomplete information. Now, there's two sort of provocative questions that come to mind from my side. One is, um, A, you said, actually in your title, you said the transition from nature to culture. Like, I'm firmly convinced that culture is part of nature. So I'm more optimistic that animals also have culture, even though they have proof. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say there is this kind of transition going on because uh, you, know, you just need to take a look at Ukraine currently, what's going on there. Certainly you may say it's not moral, but you know, it's an effect of culture and it's uh, more brutal than a lot of things going on in nature. So in, in a sense, um, so that's one thing, this transition I'm interested in. And the other thing, um, so would you agree that culture is part of nature? Uh, that's question one. And question two is you said culture is a reservoir for memories. And that I think is a really, really interesting notion because if you look at your uh, models, you have individuals interacting with each other and there's some kind of interaction. And this is actually, if you go to cultural evolution conferences, you know, there's lots of papers where like, how do kids learn from their parents to do X? And then the question is, how does that process evolve over time? Well, um, if you take this series and you say, culture is a reservoir um, for memories, then the question arises, is culture itself some active complex systems that computes by itself? Like is the reservoir, a reservoir computer, where some stuff is computed that does not happen in the minds of the people that participate in the culture. And, and so that means, do we need a more systematic approach? So if I, if I combine my two questions in one question is, A, is culture part of nature and should we study it as a whole because focusing on individuals and individual interactions will get us nowhere? Would you subscribe to that? Yes, Johan. Uh, great questions. Is it okay if I give a brief answer to your first question? And then uh, I think your second question is the perfect question to pass along to Fredrik Jansson, who is here and who studies actually exactly what you're after in the second question. Okay. So uh, a brief answer to your first question. I mean, the distinction between nature and culture to me is really of two different kind of phenomena. So the, the culture, the nature to culture uh, illustration is if from a scientific point of view, how can we create a model to understand uh, how a kind of psychology can evolve 
that can give rise to Rome. Uh, and in that sense, we see that only one species has built Rome. Uh, so in that sense, I would, I am not that inclined to kind of debate definitions, but the way we think about nature and culture, I think it's, uh, you can think about this as a major evolutionary transition, because when we create this cultural world, so to speak, uh, it's, we have been uh, inspired by John Maynard Smith and Eos Shatmari's book, The Major Transitions in Evolution, where they talk about major transitions as, for instance, going before when there was only asexual reproduction, going to sexual reproduction. After that transition, we don't know exactly how that happened, but we know that after that transition, information is really organized in a different way passed along in a different way. So going to the transition from nature to culture, we see that in this world where we live, information is organized in a different way, structured differently, and we don't know exactly how it happened, but we're interested in trying to understand this transition, how it can uh, happen, so to speak. Uh, that's a short answer to your question. Could question. I add just briefly? Yeah. Like, I think your example is, is very interesting when you talk about Ukraine and, and uh, well, brutalness and destructiveness and lack of moral mm. and so on. And that is not, uh, uh, it wouldn't be a claim that we're going from something worse to yeah. something better. Yeah. And being cultural beings is just having the ability for cumulative culture. And it doesn't mean that we reach some kind of higher goal. I mean, the cumulative culture can be very destructive. And of course, uh, as you once said, all the emotional systems and, and responses and violence that are present in animals are still present in humans. So that's nothing that has evolved away, sort of. So, I mean, it's, it's all uh, uh, very compatible with humans being very irrational and very brutal and so on. Thank you very much. Frederick. Frederick, sorry. Uh, yes, hello. Um, yeah, that was an interesting uh, question that I won't be able to answer, uh, of <laughs> course, uh, but uh, uh, I'm doing theoretical work where we argue that we need a systems approach to cultural evolution uh, because we can't really get very far down to the mechanisms uh, of cultural change without looking at, well, if we just study things at a very high level uh, and not considering how cultural traits interact with other cultural traits. Um, and well, we, when you start to consider it, can consider the interactions between different cultural units, if that's what we want to call them, then of course we are able to explain more by looking at well, properties of culture. But then I think you had the question, is culture a machine? Do we get all the way down to explain, being able to explain all cultural phenomena without including individuals? Uh, well, that's, I guess, you know, that would bring us into memetics, uh, I guess. Um, well, the culture <laughs> need to, needs to reside, uh, th things happen when, when culture resides in human brains. So I think there is some biology going on there as well. Uh, we do, we process informa information, we use, we process information by using previous information we've already have, previous cultural information, but there are probably some biological co components as well leading us to do that in a certain way. Th that is a very productive misunderstanding of what I said. I did, ah, not, okay. claim, I did not claim that culture as itself is a machine um, and I would never restrict based on you know whatever I know about complex systems, I would never say uh, there is a kind of mimetic process, selfish memes, um, and then uh, sort of this doesn't play a role. I think this is fundamental. What I'm after is 
Um, like in, in, in a flock of starlings, the reaction time of a flock of starlings is way shorter than the reaction time of an individual starling. So something must have happened in the flock, or must happen in the flock, which is more than what's happening in the bird. And so then the key question is, uh, is this kind of, um, you could say, computation? There has been a paper by uh, um, Chico Camargo recently, which is about the fact that there is a certain um, things happening uh, in biology where that look a lot like algorithmic computation, but don't even necessitate evolution, um, and nevertheless result in symmetries and stuff like that. And so, so that there is a there's sort of one question is it, it's not like oh is there is culture like a machine and do we need individuals but no in addition to all this is there an added value of cultural interaction is there something happening in culture that is not the fault of any individual and if I only look at the pairwise interactions of say parents with children I will never get the full sort of interaction uh, going on that that was sort of the question. But yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, there's Mila Oiva and Mike Tom. Has Mike already asked a question? Let's start with Mila and then go with Mike. Is that okay? Okay. Mila. Okay, so if Mike, that's okay for you. Um, yeah, so thank you. Really like mind blowing um, presentations. I'm myself a cultural historian, so my angle is a little bit maybe different and maybe some kind of like like stupid questions are following <laughs> here. So first I would like to ask Anna um, as, um, you know, I might be complicating things too much, uh, but um, kind of like, as you were talking about these learning simulations, it seems to me that you are looking at a learning of one individual, but of course, um, language is a, it's a pretty much like social phenomenon. So I'm just curious, have you been looking at and how complicated would it be to look at kind of uh, learning uh, within a group or kind of like learning of a group of individuals and how that actually evolves? And um, I have another question for maybe um, for both Johan and, and Anna. Um, both of you give examples uh, and compare compare like human learning to animal learning. So I'm just curious, um, have you what is the relation to machine learning and and are there kind of like comparisons that you have been doing uh, with machine learning uh, in your studies? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Mila, and those are really the opposite of stupid questions, I would say, <laughs> super relevant. So uh, I will uh, go for the first question of learning simulations. And uh, the thing is the whole field of simulating both the emergence of language and language change and doing mathematical modeling and uh, simulation models of this is really new. So if you look at population levels, there are uh, uh, quite a few studies on uh, language change and in agent-based models. I mean, I have done it, Fredrik has done it as well. And, and we have the AI lab in Brussels that started with the naming game. And those uh, studies tend to look at, uh, well, change in, in single features. So it's not really looking at language as a system. It, the, the field is too premature for that. That's a future ambition. So it really, those kind of language change models, they are really more looking at linguistic features as any cultural traits and not really including the systems feature of a language. And the, the learning simulations that we are looking at, they are extremely basic and they are basic on purpose, because we are looking at uh, a pre-stage of language. We are only looking at the prerequisite for language. So we are looking at sequence discrimination that we think is an uncontroversial necessary prerequisite for more complex language. And we try to model a mechanism that is able to do this. And well, I am already <laughs> doing a more uh, complicated, we can say, learning models, still very basic, but we add the chunking and we actually look at artificial languages and future-wise at um, natural languages with Jerome Michaud, who is also part of the center. And we are hoping for this basic model. I mean, the first goal is to see if it can acquire more complex language. 
And then we will use the same kind of simple model and introduce it into agents and see if we can make a language with an actual grammar emerge there. And that's something that is still unseen. We, we, we see things like, okay, we have an object and we describe different characteristics of them. That's, that's what they do at the, the Brussels AI lab, for example. But to see a compositional language where we have a, a, that can express causal relationships, for example, it's, it's still not done. And we're really trying to explore what we need. How can we make as, a, an as simple model as possible that will actually enable this? And, and this is a goal that it will take a long time to reach, I think, but that's, that's where we are heading. And the second question, I think, perhaps you won. Uh, okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, great question. Uh, when it comes to similarities, as you said, between the associative learning models and machine learning, I think the, similar, the similarities are great. And I'm, uh, uh, I've used the chat for some shameless, shameless self-propagation and uh, I just put three links to three different papers. And the last one is where we describe the A-learning model. And in that we have a part where we compare our learning model with different models in uh, uh, reinforcement learning. So in many ways, it's very, very similar to some of the models in reinforcement learning, like Q-learning, for instance. Uh, the inspiration for our model was that we are modeling the stimulus response memories, but we're also having an equation for what's called condition reinforcement or secondary reinforcement. So we have those two parts. And the condition reinforcement is that uh, even non, even neutral uh, stimuli can acquire a positive value driving learning in itself. So that enables then learning behavior sequences. So lots of similarities, but also some differences uh, would you like to go into more detail or is that, is it okay with the paper I put in the chat? Okay, great, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Mike Thumb. Yeah, I have several relatively small, well, I have a, one thing which is too big to discuss uh, and several rather small ones, uh, given, uh, given the amount of time. The big one is basically that uh, I, from what I understood from Eric's talk, it sounded very interesting, but I haven't understood much. And I would very much appreciate well, an in, 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 in ability to, to, to sort of uh, make many follow-up questions, trying to, to figure out what's actually going on there, but, but, but I guess we, we, are, we, are, we are not having uh, the time there. So I will just uh, do more short and more concrete questions uh, to, 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 to the concerning to other talks. Uh, uh, basically, one thing I haven't understood is, well, you basically, uh, Jochen, you basically said that there are uh, uh, two uh, possibilities. One, that, that culture emerged in, 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 in many, uh, small evolutionary steps throughout uh, throughout the growth of well evolving of humans and then and another one that, that there is was some uh, some big event at some point and after that people are uh, essentially as they are now and you as far as I understood you uh, believe in the second uh, in the second uh, uh, of these two, two, two things that I haven't understood why. Uh, so that is basically the question. Uh, and the second thing I wanted to ask uh, concerning this sequence learning thing, uh, it is known in, uh, in biophysical concept, uh, context, and, and, and I actually worked a little bit on this, that in, in uh, uh, biopolymers, it is important that there are, uh, uh, that there is a minimal size of alphabet, that you cannot create meaningful proteins with just two amino acids, for example, or even probably three or four. There is a minimal size of, of different objects you need to, to, uh, to, to, to order in order to, to produce a, a a biologically meaningful sort of sentence in in, 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 in in biophysical sense. Is there any analog there in in in, 
in, in, in what you do for, for this? Is there any difference between learning to distinguish between between two, I don't know, A and B, yellow and, and blue, or and, and being distinguished between many things? Uh, and and I think there was one more. Uh, Ah, yes, and the third comment, which concerning what Mila asked, it, it, it came back to my mind that uh, several months ago we, we listened to the uh, Simon Kirby's uh, lecture, and there it was very, very prominent that for, for uh, sort of evolving of language, uh, it is uh, it is always interplay of learning and teaching that 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 when you optimize learning and when you optimize teaching you optimize different things and that creates sort of frustration and interplay which which sort of forms a complexity in learning in, in language so can you comment on that and how relevant is for what you think that's my question thank you very much uh... Should I have a go at the first one? And Anna, you want to go on the second and third? Yeah. Uh, so the first one is that I think that we can distinguish. I, I think when it comes to different explanations for the evolution of like the human mind, so to speak, I think that we have a, there's a gradual uh, reduction or increase, if you like, of what the strength of the genetic determination. And if we go from very strong determination, we have uh, like this kind of strong evolutionary psychology from the like California school in the 80s, Santa Barbara, uh, where there is strong modularity. Uh, we have evolved independent computational modules, so to speak. And then like on the other side, we have like the, the cultural gadget book by Cecilia Hayes who says that without specifying how humans are different from other animals, it's just that basically we learn the mental skills that we have. They are all cultural gadgets. And like in, in the bit, then we have like other schools like uh, Take Boyd and Richardson, Joe Henrik, for instance, they usually point to the importance of uh, cultural learning. But what we learn from who we learn are to some de extent determined by genetic biases, like could be prestige bias or conformity bias, and that they are genetic in itself. Uh, in our book, we, we are kind of, we're very close to Cecilia Hayes in what we think regarding... It's a California oh, school. No! <laughs> <laughs> the California school shut down the Zoom call, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> But what, perhaps I can go to and comment on the Kirby question while you want yeah, exactly. to get exactly. back. So, I mean, I, I'm glad you took up the work of Simon Kirby. It's really fundamental for language evolution. And it's very compatible with what you do because, I mean, and it's, it's also very compatible with Cecilia Hayes that you want, just mentioned, basically saying that we don't need strong genetic determinants for language structure to emerge. So the experiments of Simon Kirby and, and colleagues from 2008, I think they are really groundbreaking and they show something extremely important in a very neat way that if you have the pressures from learnability, so you have to transmit something and you have the pressure from uh, expressivity or informativity and you combine them, the most effective solution to this is some kind of compositional systematic grammar. So. And when you take away one of the two pressures, we don't get this. So this really shows that it is the cultural environment and the transmission process that forms language, that language is, does not have to be genetically predetermined. So that's very much compatible with what we do. The question that Kirby and his colleagues do not address is that if language is purely formed by learning, why don't other animals have it? Cecilia Hayes also points to language as a cultural gadget that is something that is acquired culturally. And she mentions that there should be some minimal difference that would uh, allow for this. Uh, but I, I, I think that 
um, one thing that we do is that we actually give a suggestion for this and we're I'm not saying it's right, but at least we try to formalize it and make this testable. What might be this minimal prerequisite that then allows for the processes that uh, Simon Kirby describes and his colleagues. You want us back, you can finish. I think there's a conspiracy here. Uh, to, <laughs> to, answer, to answer your question very briefly, uh, when in this nature nurture, uh, uh, on this scale of nature nurture, I think we have been very inspired by developmental psychology, looking at the ontogeny of mental skills. And uh, what we see is that comparing with other animals, we see that the, what we think of as these unique human skills without going to kind of human exceptionalism, but the things that are uncontroversial, only humans do math, et cetera, language. Uh, we see that they have all in common that we have to learn these things. Another thing is that we cannot develop these skills without social transmission of information. We need to learn from others. So the information comes from others, not from our genetics. Another thing is that all these skills, we, have, we, we don't find these. Hang on. Okay. Yes. Um, but we got the point. So this is fitting with what you said, Anna, before. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this compositional grammar thing. And uh, at least one member in the audience knows that I brought this up in a lunch break. Um, so one of the key issues is that, again, this points to sort of systematic kind of whatever you want to call it, reservoir idea or whatever. So there's both in society and in the, in the brain itself. So there's, it cannot be only sequences. There is something else happening. Is well, that... sequence would, would, would give rise to it, right? I mean, of course, language is absolutely a complex system. We think mm -hmm. about culture as a complex system. And the, the whole idea about the complex system is, as you say, that the whole is larger than the parts and that uh, simple local processes can give rise to large complexity. So the question is, how little can we put into the agents to and then make them interact to common goals somehow in a simulation, for example? How little can we put in them for them to be able to create compositional language, complex systems? That's the direction we're working in. So we're definitely not only interested in the individual yeah. mechanisms. We're starting there, and Fredrik is already on the cultural systems, and we want to bridge the whole um, range there. That's really our lab's ambition. That, that's very interesting. So there's, there's two more questions in the queue. Uh, so I don't make this a question, but you mentioned the naming game twice, which is also coming out, out of evolutionary game theory, which has exactly the method, which I think is a quite interesting uh, point to emphasize, which also very reluctantly actually sort of uh, transforms itself towards larger systems and complexity science. Mark Metz. Uh, uh, it was it was interesting where you cut off uh, Johan Lind, sorry, but you were saying that you're more closer to Cecilia Hayes. Uh, well, why is it so? Shortly, sorry. Yes, so I, I made the point that when we look at how these uniquely human mental skills are acquired by the indiv individual, we note that uh, they're learned, they need, they require social information they uh, develop gradually. Um, we also see that they're often, they're of too recent origin to be understood as genetic adaptations, so to speak. So I think developmental psychology in that sense has been very important and it's so rich of empirical observations that I think are informative for looking at the nature nurture, how they do develop. Um, yeah, that's what, that was a bit more complete answer. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I would go ahead, actually. Yeah, what, I know what you said before about uh, uh, looking into the um, causal, um, uh, so, so causal relations, how uh, and language evolution in relation to that, it, it brings to mind the sort of uh, uh, subject verb object and uh, subject object verb language um, evolution studies. I think they were done with uh, uh, kind of, uh, 
developing like novel gesture, gesture languages. And, and, but these studies, I think, were related exactly to, uh, to the, how different causal relations give rise to this, uh, whether a subject verb object or subject object verb kind of languages. But maybe, maybe it's, I don't know if it was related to, you said it like it's, 15 it's, minutes I mean, ago. You're thinking about the silent gestures paradigm with Marika Schorstra, for example, also the from the gestures, Edinburgh lab. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, probably. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's everything is related, sort of. I mean, I think if, if the whole, I think what we do is very compatible with kind of the Edinburgh school, if, if, you, if you will. Um, but they are, and they are looking at these processes experimentally. And we are doing a lot of modeling. And I think they kind of match. I mean, the whole idea, when you are starting to look at causal relationships, for example, uh, we think that the complexity, if we put some minimal mechanism in the individual, it's really the utility and complexity of the world that will make, that will at least partly guide what structure emerges. So it's like an interaction with the, the minimal cognitive elements. We want to keep them minimal. We will only add things if we need to. And then, of course, um, things like doer and, and the, the undergoer of the doing and so on, the classical semantic relationships, they are there in the world. And the silent gesture experiments also show that there is some kind of iconicity there, that there, there, some, some word orders are more common than others. But then, because we are also able to reprocess languages, we can use both different kinds of word orders. I don't know if I'm answering your, to your question, but we, we kind of think of it as an interaction of some minimal cognitive elements that allow for understanding, for example, causal reasoning. And then language emerges, it can be partly path dependent, it can be a coincidence what structure emerges, but it sort of needs to be able to uh, content the most important information in the world, you know, and then we start to do a lot of other things, you know, expressing identity and all that. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, you, you, did, you did. But I would, I would grab, grab hold from the. I had one more question, but it's, it's kind of. I will ask this one. Uh, so, so you focused on this computational modeling aspect in Edinburgh to do experimental stuff. But what do you see the role of the? Well, what I see in, in, in our lab, in cultural analytics, that uh, focusing a lot on this kind of taking a large uh, scale of databases and seeing, trying to find patterns from it. So how do you see how it relates to your methods? Like, do you, do you see it like that mathematical modeling is uh, one step and from there you, uh, there would be development to Mars. Okay, let's do experiments, find out more, and then let's, let's look at real world data. How would you relate it? All of this, I think, are very uh, complementary. Yeah. So, I mean, big data, empirical data is very important. And I mean, we, I, I think, as you would also be, are interested in large empirical data, uh, experimental data and models, because in models, we can explore the logical, we can be very explicit and we can explore what leads to what further than we can think it, so to say. And in experiments, we can also, uh, take out some parts and we can control them. And then of course the natural data are the observations that we have that we want to explain and we want to see if our models and our experiments match them. So I don't think any of them can live without the others. Well, yeah, but there was a method. I guess the cultural evolution paradigm is like well, well evolved by now because it's all of these methods are actually used, right? So, yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. We get, we get... Uh, officially five minutes, but we can go a bunch of minutes over, I think, uh, because we we had some out time as in soccer. Um, so there is two questions in the line. One is Nila and one is Andres Cario. So please stick to one question so we get both of you in. Nila. Okay, yeah, so I have a question to Eric. Um, so you said that um, kind of like your approach is that personality is hidden within a language, if I understood correctly. So kind of like the way we speak somehow re represents our personality, if I, if I understand correctly. And, and then you briefly mentioned that you have this, uh, this publication in which you are using uh, data from New Zealand and, and from Sweden, if I remember correctly. And I assume that they are 
probably in 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 English and in Swedish languages. So I'm kind of like curious as kind of like as my own experience is that I um, express myself a little bit in different ways in depending on the language that I happen to speak at, at that time. So I'm just kind of like curious. So do you do you mean that um, kind of like that that people express their um, personality depending on the language or that it's kind of like a representation of a personality is independent from the language that they are using for, for expressing themselves. And maybe uh, this is continuation. This is not a ne next question, <laughs> uh, Max. So um, I'm just oh, kind sorry. of like, yeah, it's um, just kind of like, you know, it would be very interesting to hear more about your, your research and kind of like, do you see some temporal or cultural differences between moral traits uh, in your, your studies? Thank you. Yes, exactly. Well, the, the sort of philosophical, philosophical side of this, my ideas of personality, that is basically borrowed from Hayes. I don't really test those uh, directly, but I just think it's very, very important to have sort of grand theories when you do things. It's very easy to get lost. If, you only, if you're walking and only looking at your feet, you're going to stumble sooner or later. And I think that's the same kind of thing, that you need something very broad to understand what to do in your specific test. So I'm not really investigating that, but I'm but I, and, and using it to try to make sense of what, go, what I see in my measures. And the, the, the difference now, as, as it was back then, when uh, item response theory was developed, that you have this abundance of large samples. Moral Foundation's questionnaire, I've looked at a handful of large samples, and they look eerily similar. And that is something that is sort of hard to explain if you assume that there are cultural differences of the type that it is often assumed to be. But it should also point out that the question that I'm referring to in the, that works, there was only half of the scale, remember, in the question that are actually good. And that's called the relevant subscale. And you can, uh, you would, I think it could be nice to look it up if you want to, it's available to everyone. But those questions are very, 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 very small and very simple. It's just a matter of a few words it sort of like pulls in some kind of, it, it, it awakes some kind of preference, some kind of intuition, and that's it. So it's nothing specific. As soon as you try to ask something very specific as the other scale does in the more foundations questionnaire, it's called the judgment, right? the com comparing. Uh, uh, there is more like it, 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 it gives an actual proposition that's, that is much more sensitive to culture, how, how you understand. For instance, one item has to do with inherent, how you, if some people shouldn't inherit wealth and so on. And that can be very cultural. For instance, asking a Swede about adoption would give you no results because it, it doesn't separate along moral camps about adoption. Most people, uh, um, abortion, sorry, most people are extreme pro abortion in Sweden, whereas in, in USA, abortion is something that clearly uh, uh, maps into something that's more conservative and so on. But there are there's more simple kinds of words that you can use. For instance, a simple word like loyalty or a simple word like compassion or fairness. Just really short answers that only contains these to something that's coherent, of course, that makes sense, but that's enough. And as soon as you go past that into something that's more complex, for instance, looking almost like a policy proposition, then you're gonna end up with a bunch of cultural effects that, that are not gonna uh, replicate across samples. So what I, and this is sort of fairly new, uh, what I'm seeing and looking at other questionnaires, it's the same kind of tendencies. Once you have these good questions are small and easy to understand and hit some, some kind of intuition, they seem to be very stable and therefore very uh, stable patterns that replicate. So you see the same positive results repeating and also the same problems repeating and that's i think is the upside of this approach so thank you very much others uh yeah how we're we gonna do are we gonna go a bit over time or should yeah we we're going a little bit yeah we can we we have time for a question okay, okay. uh yeah uh, hello nice to see you um yeah so just following up um uh, anna what you said about um well, you said before that the long, long, longer game is, is to you know build on these foundational models, but make them more complex and have them actually produce something language like. Um, and and then in one of the answers now you mentioned like for example word order how you know the experimental data shows that 
some orders are might be preferable, but then again, all possible orders are almost uh, used in the languages of the world. But then, uh, word order is is not something that is use that exists in isolation. It's it's a part of, as you said yourself, this very complex system. So maybe the uh, language that use this sort of um, this preferred order might have something else that compensates for it. So so that leads me to ask: Do you think do you think there's like a limit? what these this sort of like um modeling paradigm can can do because the more complex you get so okay so you have this very foundational cognitive model and then you add something else and something else something that creates compositionality something else something that creates word order and you you get more and more of these components but all of them have to be tested against data and the data is just i guess the test is like does it produce a human language like thing but then the more things you add the more parameters you add you know you have this exponential parameter space yeah, growth. Yeah, yeah. Give, and the physicists point, say, give me three parameters and I will give you an elephant. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so do you think there's a there's a limit somewhere how, how far you can go with, with this paradigm? Or do you think there are ways to get around this? I mean, the way you describe it, it's going to be ugly, <laughs> right? I mean, we want, and I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, the whole idea is to try to keep it very simple, but to put the right components in a model. <laughs> if, if it turns out that the models in the end become very complex, okay, well, if that's what we need, but I mean, if, if we want to make it very, if we start to make it very particular, so I'm going to program here that there is word order. I'm going to program here that if there's no word order, well, then let's put case marking there. I mean, if, no, this, that should be emergent and it should correspond to, so we need to put as few uh, components in our models as possible. We are currently looking basically at a short, very limited sequence memory, some kind of symbolizing capacity or chunking. You can call it any of the two. You can chunk elements and, uh, well, you can maintain some short sequences and their structure in your memory. And if And then you need to put the right components in the model real world as well puts mm -hmm. some kind of causal relationships there some kind of collaboration between individuals and the idea is to yeah. try to keep it minimal so in of a, course in there is a limitation and and if we start mm -hmm. to put a lot of stuff in it then there will be another alternative that is equally complex that might explain that yes. might give you the same result exactly so we are yeah. looking at the most simple model we can find and try would to would you say you're you're minimalist in some sense oh extremely yeah <laughs> are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, of course, we, we should look for the simplest explanation. And if a, an interesting result is a very simple model that can explain a lot, and you can't find an equally simple model, a, an equally simple alternative that can explain the emergence of compositional structure, the emergence of word order or case marking or whatever, you know, that's, that's the idea, but we have a, a long way to go. And mm. we might reach a ceiling. I mean, who knows? But we, we yeah, are but we are pushing the ceiling, you know. <laughs> but I'm guessing the difference between your minimalism and like the minimalism is that you're probably not applying to some sort of um, like a language organ or something. Yeah, no. I mean, not. It's not Chomsky and minimalism. Yeah, I'm guessing it's not. No, it's not mm. because Chomsky is is saying that this is language specific. Mm -hmm. And I think also Chomsky, I mean, he's not really computing it. He's not trying out his models computationally. He's very verbal, even though he frames it as something mathematical. And Chomsky also is very explicit that merge uh, erases order. I, 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 and I think that's wrong if you test it. It's not, I mean, structure is very important, but in order to establish a structure, you need to have the basic perception of discriminating A, B from B, A. And I mean, if you test that, you can see it, but he never tested it. But I, I mean, Chomsky is a pioneer and I think he posed the right questions. And the minimalist, the ambition of being minimalistic is good, but mm. uh, I think they went wrong on many points, the Chomskyans. But yeah, I mean, it's, um, uh, I, I would love to discuss this forever, but I mean, those are, those are very interesting questions. And of course, we, we try to see how far we can reach. You, you want to give one last comment? Yeah, just with the risk of being banal, but when you look at different 
um, sizes of uh, models, for instance, just to look at the learning phenomena and what different models and neural networks can do. Uh, if we have really big models, we can look at what they can perform, but we don't understand why they achieve what they achieve. Yeah. So if we have those big models, we all of a sudden need to go to statistical analyses to understand the output of those models. So I think that these different approaches, they really solve different problems and we should use them all, but they are very different in what they can tell us about different things. So just that. Thank you, thank you very much. I think we, we have to sort of like slowly close the meeting. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I like that we ended up in exactly this situation where, you know, super minimalism, the two asynchronous uh, tape machines of Steve Reich resulting in come out and show them everything you want to have in music is in there. While on the other hand, if you look at a human cell, there's lots of protein doing lots of different stuff, and it's probably not going to run on a simple equation with like one variable. Uh, so we need to stay humble, I guess. Um, what I would like to do at the end uh, is invite uh, you to attend next week and the week after next week until the end of the semester and then come back. So next week we're going to uh, continue in the same way, so to speak, with Anne Kandler, uh, who's also a well-known person in cultural evolution from patterns to processes. Um, after that we will have Yulo Tinio and Bruce Mao uh, speaking about the new convergence of art, science, and technology. Uh, then there is, will be Quinn uh, Dombrovsky, who uh, will talk about something completely different, uh, data setting, but uh, she's also collecting the um, cultural heritage on the web from Ukraine in the last couple of weeks, you may have heard that. And then we will have Frank Schweitzer, uh, so, who is well known in systems design and also sort of um, related to evolutionary game theory, agent-based models and stuff like that. So. Uh, there is a sort of topical similarity, and so this is particularly also an, uh, 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 an, an invitation to all of you here in Stockholm. But I think there is a great future, both for cultural evolution and for cultural analytics more general, or you can say vice versa, cultural analytics in particular, cultural evolution more general. Um, I love that this pen out, and uh, let's continue the conversation. Thank you very much, um, and see you very soon. Thank you. Is it possible to, do you have a, a mailing list so you can, yes, so we I do. can get information on your seminars? We, we actually we actually do have a mailing list. Um, the, that's uh, maybe also, I can say this to everybody. So the mailing list is a low frequency mailing list on purpose. So we send out four emails a year. But if you want to see what's going on on a weekly or even more high frequently basis, follow us on Twitter, Kudan Lab is the account. So we will, uh, every week we send out reminders of what's happening. And so, yes, thank you. Maybe see you again. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, bye-bye. Very nice, thank you.